I hope you have all enjoyed working on chapters four, five, and six in your textbooks. It's now time to review your work and the important concepts in those chapters. As we continue our faith journey in preparation for receiving Eucharist for the first time, remember that there are many other things that you and your families can do to help you prepare to receive the sacrament beyond our textbooks. You can pray, you can receive reconciliation often, and most importantly, you can attend Mass. To begin our time together today, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the previous chapters, we learned about our church, our parish community, and we talked about the first parts of the Mass, the introductory rites, and the liturgy of the Word. Chapter 4 is about the next part of the Mass, called the Liturgy of the Eucharist. On page 51 in your books, we see a picture of a family. They look like they're celebrating someone's birthday. There are balloons, a cake with candles, and gifts. Page 50 asks you to think about another kind of gift that you can give to other people. Gifts that you can't wrap or tie with a bow. They are asking you to think about things that you can do or say that show others how much you care about them. When we celebrate the Eucharist, we receive the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus himself, given now, to right, us Mrs. out of Kirk. love. It is the greatest gift of all. I mean, is there anything more amazing no. than Holy Eucharist? No, there isn't. It is a beautiful and wonderful gift, free from God. It's better than Christmas. That's now, true. some of you kids may say, hmm, it's better than my Christmas gifts? And I would say, yes, it is. Mrs. Kirk, I, I'm really sorry I interrupted you. Please. That's fine, Father. Page 52 and 53 in your books tell the story of the Last Supper. What Jesus said at the Last Supper is a very important part of the liturgy of the Eucharist. Jesus and his disciples had traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish feast of Passover. Each year on that feast, the Jewish people gathered with their families to thank God for leading their ancestors out of slavery. This time, when Jesus and his disciples gathered, Jesus did something different. Jesus broke the bread for the meal into pieces and gave it to each person saying, this is my body. Then he took a cup of wine, which is what they drank with dinner back then, and he passed it to each person there, saying, This is my blood. Oh, Mrs. Kirk, before you continue, guys, this is what is called consecration. When the Holy Spirit comes down upon the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The bread, it changes. It looks the same but it's not the same anymore. That bread is now the body of Christ. And the wine that you saw the deacon pour into the chalice, it's not wine anymore. It's the blood. And Mrs. Kirk just read that that's what Scripture says. That's what Jesus said. And that's what we believe. Well, go ahead, Mrs. Kirk. Sorry for interrupting you again. <laughs> Jesus gave us the gift of himself. He asked his disciples to celebrate this special meal again and again in memory of him. Today, when we gather together and celebrate Mass, we know as Catholic Christians that the same thing happens. 
Now, on page 54 and 55 of your book, we learn about the part of the Mass called the Liturgy of the Eucharist. The priest prepares the table or the altar and then accepts our gifts of bread and wine. The priest then prays special prayers over the gifts. We are reminded during the Liturgy of the Eucharist that the Mass is a sacrifice. We offer our gifts to God, just as Jesus offered or sacrificed his life for our sins. During the Eucharistic prayer, on pages 56 and 57 in your book, the priest, with the power of the Holy Spirit, says and does what Jesus said and did at the Last Supper. This particular part of the Eucharistic prayer is called the Consecration, as Father Chris said. The priest places the bread that becomes the body of Jesus on a special plate called the paten. The cup or chalice is filled with wine that becomes the blood of Jesus. We believe that Jesus is really present in the consecrated bread and wine, now the body and blood of Jesus. Mrs. Kerr. Yes, Father. Now, we're not at Mass. No. Is Jesus here? Absolutely. Where is he? In the tabernacle. He's in the tabernacle. Mm-hmm. Is that why people kneel when they come into the church? Yes, it is. People think that you're kneeling to the cross, and you're not actually. You're kneeling towards the tabernacle, which is underneath the cross here. Ah, uh, I think that's where I'm going to stop. Right. I'm going to stand over here, <laughs> Only a priest can consecrate the bread and wine. After the Eucharistic prayer, we prepare ourselves to receive Jesus. Now, let's turn to page 63 in your book. Chapter 5 talks about receiving the greatest gift of all, Holy Eucharist. Page 64 asks you to tell how you felt at a family celebration. Let's think about that for a minute. Think of a family celebration. Were you happy? Were you excited? Were you glad to be with your family and friends? Don't you feel special when you get an invitation in the mail or email or over the phone? We have received a special invitation from Jesus to attend a special celebration called the Mass. We go to church to thank God for the many gifts that he has given us. We also go to church to remember Jesus' death and resurrection. Oh, I have to interrupt right here. Okay, so remember, she said remember. She said that word twice. See, and what are we going to remember? Are we going to remember the dress that we wore on Easter Sunday? Or are we going to remember the gifts that we got for Christmas? No, no, no. It's not that. It's Jesus that we remember. Every time. She used the word sacrifice. Well, that's what this is. It's a sacrifice that our Lord Jesus did for us, the cross, and then we get to remember him, and we remember him by celebrating the Mass, and in particular, that greatest gift of all that you mentioned. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Do you want to continue? Yes. Okay. Yes. On page 66 and 67, you see the story from Luke's Gospel called The Road to Emmaus. After Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the dead, he did not return to his Father in heaven right away, but he remained here on earth. In this story, he came to two of his disciples that were walking to Emmaus, a town not too far from Jerusalem. They did not recognize Jesus. The two men were talking about what had happened to a man called Jesus, who had been crucified, had died, and had been buried in a tomb. The stranger walked with them for a while, and then they invited him to dinner with them. When the stranger did the same thing with the bread, 
that Jesus had done at the Last Supper, they realized that the stranger was indeed Jesus, risen from the dead. Can you imagine how they felt? Page 68 talks about the last part of the Liturgy of the Eucharist called the Communion Rite. Everyone in the church will stand together and recite the Lord's Prayer, just as we did this morning. Then we exchange the sign of peace. Now, usually that's a handshake. During a pandemic year, we just can nod at each other. But that handshake, that sign of peace, reminds us that through baptism, we are all children of God, members of the same faith family. We then pray the prayer called the Lamb of God. Now, if you look at the pictures on page 71 and 72, it shows you what happens next. This is when you will be receiving the body of Jesus. Father, can we help you? You will approach the front of the altar with your hands together like this. And unfortunately, during a pandemic year, we will have one of these on. You approach the priest or the deacon and you bow slightly out of respect. Then you put your hands together like this. Your, she, your she's making, she's making that. Now, this looks holy, but it's not just looking holy. It's about being respectful. And you know, it, you don't do this. So your hat would fall off your head. You bow like this. Just a middle, you know, a middle bow. And you're saying, well, this is perfect. You hold this. There we go. And you're saying, I understand what this is. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you honor and show respect. And then, Mrs. Kirk, the one thing that I see kids get awfully confused about is which hand do they put where and what does it look like? So I'm going to turn just a little bit and you're going to turn just a little bit so that they can see you better. And then I'm going to say the words, the body of Christ. What do you do? Watch what I do. This is the hand that I write with. So this is the hand that I put on the bottom. Notice my hands aren't down here. We don't want the priest or the deacon to have to bend to place the consecrated host in your hands. So put it up high like this. Father Chris said, the body of Christ. So you only have one thing to say, and that's the word amen. Remember, amen means I believe. Now, you're saying amen to the fact that you believe that the consecrated host is now the body of Jesus Christ. It's a very short word, a very small word, but it means an awful lot. So I would just say amen, and then Father or the deacon will place the consecrated host in your hand. Now you don't go like this. You stand here. You take the hand that you write with, pick up the host, then ever so gently pull your mask away and put the host in your mouth, on your tongue. Put your hands back together. You can chew. I was taught not to chew, but we can chew now. And then you walk away. You do not move until you put the consecrated host in your mouth. Put your hands back together, and then you will quietly go back to your pew and sit down. You want to pray about what just happened. You want to thank God for the miracle that has just happened. Each and every time you receive the Eucharist, it's a miracle. The first time is special, and that's what you'll be doing very soon. Thank you, Father. You're welcome, Mrs. Kirk. I'll stand over here again, okay? So once you've returned to your pew, once the communion hymn is over, you can say the prayer after communion, and that is found in the back of your book, 
on page 94. Or you can also say your own prayer of thanks to Jesus for what just happened. Think about the miracle that just happened and thank Jesus for that. We are strengthened with God's grace to do the work that Jesus wants us to continue for him when we receive the Eucharist. Now, the last chapter in your book is entitled Living as the Body of Christ. What does that mean? This chapter not only talks about the last part of the Mass, but it also talks about what comes after the Mass. The picture on page 77 shows a family spending time together and taking care of their community and our earth by recycling. On page 78, you were asked to write down ways that you could show love and kindness to others in your words and actions. That reminds me of the first part of our presentation where we talked about gifts that we don't wrap and don't tie with a bow. Those are the kind of things that we're talking about in this chapter. Jesus showed love and care for all people, not just people that looked exactly like him or, or people that lived the way he lived. We each have been given special gifts or talents that we can use to help others. The scripture story on page 80 and 81 in your book talks about what happened right after Jesus ascended or rose to be with his Father in heaven. He told his disciples in the stories to gather together, and most of them were kind of afraid because they hadn't seen Jesus since he had died. And as the story says, they could hardly believe their eyes. Like anyone that is going away, Jesus wanted to say goodbye to them. But he also had an important message for them. He told them that their work was just beginning. He told them to baptize people that wanted to share in the love of God and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sounds a little bit like that prayer we say when we say, do the sign of the cross, doesn't it? He wanted the disciples to teach people how to be followers of Jesus and his teachings. Lastly, he promised his disciples that he would be with them always. Page 82 talks about when the Mass ends with what we call the concluding rites. In the concluding rites, we receive a blessing asking God to watch over us, as we know he always does. The priest or deacon dismisses us, telling us to go in peace or to go forth. The Mass has ended. But we have homework to do. We are called to help others at home, at school, on the ball field, at church, even across the ocean. Whenever someone needs our help, our kindness, and our love, we are called to help. Just like the disciples, every time you receive Eucharist, you are given the grace to go out and do God's work. And you take Jesus with you, inside of you, to help you. That is what receiving the Eucharist is all about. You can't keep that gift to yourself. You need to open it to share God's love with others. It's my turn. You know, this day, the first day you receive Holy Eucharist, it is going to be an amazing day. But something takes away from that day, and it takes away from it just a little bit. But <clears throat> when we get scared about what we're going to do for the first time, you know, like, I don't write in this hand. This hand is the one I write in. Okay, uh, I'm, I have to lift my hand. What's the priest going to say again? The body of Christ. What do I say? I say, amen. There's, there's all kinds of things going on there. 
and it can be, it can make you nervous. And I'm telling you, you shouldn't be nervous. Imagine, if you will, our Lord Jesus standing there in front of you with his arms wide open and his beautiful heart showing to the whole world. And there, in his hands, he has a host. And, and he loves you so much. He's giving you himself. He loves you so much. That's the biggest deal of the Eucharist. He loves us so much that he did that up there. He died on a cross for us. And yes, Mrs. Kirk is right. It's, it can be confusing for people to understand what exactly is going on during the Mass. It might be a little confusing to you at first, but as you keep coming to Mass and keep receiving Jesus, something's going to change in you. Mrs. Kirk said, well, there's homework. I don't like homework. I don't even like the word homework. It means like there's extra things I have to do, even if I don't want to. Well, homework is a good example, Mrs. Kirk. But why don't we say instead, you have to leave the church and look for Jesus. Wow. Isn't that something? When someone is hurting and they don't look like Jesus, what do you do? You take the Jesus that you've just received in your mouth and that is in your heart and you go to them and you greet them and you say hello. And you ask questions. And then you might even offer to pray with them. So, you know, getting to know either the Our Father or the Hail Mary, that's a pretty good idea. But imagine, if you will, being that person who's sitting alone. Now, all of a sudden, there's someone there that cares. See, and what's going to happen is that person that's sitting alone they are going to see Jesus. And you're going to be the one to show them. Because you have Jesus in you. And you go and you help someone else as part of... I don't want to say using Jesus. That doesn't sound right. But as part of giving Jesus away. Each week you're going to come to Mass. And each week, one of the big things is to see how many times we can give Jesus away. You know, and there's that pesky little word grace out there. Well, you get grace from receiving Holy Eucharist. And you're giving grace to the people that you help, the people that you smile at, the people that you greet even in your own home. So you'll see people that need Jesus. And because you come to Mass and you've received him, you're, you're a walking greatest gift. That's what you are. And your big thing is to make sure that you give him away. And if you give him away too many times, does that mean you're empty? No. That just means that God is going to fill you with more so that you can give more away. And that more is love and grace. Now, guys, there's so many things going on, you know, as you learn more about the Mass. Today, I'm wearing white. We wear white during the Easter season. That's from... Easter Sunday to Pentecost. We wear white at special Masses. 
we wear white during the Christmas season, the octave, if you will, the eight days, we wear white then. And we wear white for special masses. But there's other colors that we wear. Now, you've seen us wear purple, and you know what season that was, right? That was Lent. And you've seen us also wear red. Why? For Good Friday, when we celebrated the passion of our Lord Jesus. We also wear red for those people that love God so much that when it came time to sacrifice, they sacrificed their whole body and soul because they loved Jesus so much. And the last color you see a lot of. You see green a lot because that's the color that we're in the most. So maybe that gives you a little bit of insight into what colors we wear. And, well, I can't encourage you enough. Receiving Eucharist for me, it was the happiest day of my life. It still remains the happiest, happiest day of my life. Even when I got ordained, it wasn't as special as the first day that I received Holy Communion. I somehow fell in love with it with God and with Jesus. And that love never went away. And I think it's one of the main reasons I'm a priest, is because I fell in love at that very moment and couldn't think of doing anything else. So, children preparing to receive Eucharist for the first time, I cannot encourage you enough to be hopeful, be loving, be kind, be merciful, be understanding, be Jesus Christ for others. Now, Mrs. Kirk didn't say, at, no, she probably did say, did you say something about the end of the Mass? And what the, yeah, you did say something about what the deacon said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she did. So, you know, what the deacon says is after the blessing. A blessing, yeah. So the priest, he says, the Lord be with you. And then the people say, and also with you. And then he says, may almighty God bless you. He raises his right hand and makes the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the Mass begins with the sign of the cross and ends with the sign of the cross. I look forward to your special day. May Almighty God bless you and bless your family as you prepare to receive First Holy Communion. Mrs. Kirk, is there something else that needs to be said? Absolutely. There is. I'm not going to stand here because I think she should stand here. Just a few more details. Um, there are a few of you that have not yet picked a date for your first Eucharist. Please email me as soon as possible with your choice from those three dates that we had emailed to you previously. Also, we've had a few questions about what do you wear when you receive Eucharist for the first time. Um, the gentlemen can re certainly wear a suit if they would like. Um, some wear pants and a shirt and a tie. It's entirely up to you, whatever you're most comfortable in. The only thing we ask is that you do not wear sneakers, if at all possible. The girls generally wear white dresses. Some of them wear veils. Some of them wear flowers in their hair. Again, that's up to you. We have a very generous First Communicant parent that has purchased five First Communion dresses four size eights and one size 10. So if there are any young ladies that do not yet have a dress for their first communion, please contact me and we can make arrangements for you to come in and take a look at them. Now, unfortunately, we would finish our uh, first Eucharist preparation usually with the first Eucharist retreat. 
We're not able to do that this year. But what we are doing instead is we ask you and your parents to drop off your completed textbook and your completed first Eucharist banner this Saturday, April 24th. I will be over in the parish hall between 10 a.m. to 12 noon, so you can drop off your book and your banner. And at that time, we have a final activity or two that we will give you to take home. We look forward to seeing you this Saturday. Thank you.